Uh. Hello? Can you, can you hear me? Maybe. Okay. My name is Jane Prusakova. Thank you for inviting me. I, I to talk about effective code review. Can you hear me? Okay. Is this better? Okay, great. Um, well, good morning. Welcome to 200K. I love to be here. Thank you, Greg, for putting it together. Thank you, the technical team. I can't figure out if I am managing the mic. One second. Is it going now? Yeah. Okay. Let's try this one. I think that one's a little quiet in the back. So sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Okay. Great. Um, my name again. My name is Jane Prusakova. I come from Texas. Uh, I live in a small college town called College Station. We are about equidistant from Houston, Austin, and Dallas. Well, Dallas is a little bit further. Um, I work for a company that's called Improving. They're, they're a consulting company. Uh, we do have some business in Oklahoma. Uh, I think it's in Oklahoma City, but uh, we do like to engage with people outside uh, of the office, and as I hope you do too, otherwise you wouldn't be here. A uh, short plug, we are hiring in Dallas and Houston. Okay, back to code reviews. There are lots of reasons to do code reviews. And uh, usually people are looking for problems in the code. It's not really the only reason, but um, besides bugs that you're going to find and requirements that you're going to remember that have or haven't been covered or that haven't been covered correctly, it gives you a chance to share knowledge, right? There, there is mentoring in code reviews. Uh, there is building a community around your team, giving people a chance to talk. I have a memory from a conference a while back when uh, I was talking to a small business owner, a guy who ran a small software company who had a few developers working for him. And he was saying, why would we ever talk? Each sits on their own cubicle and writes code for me. And that's the most effective way to build systems. I didn't know what to answer then, but it, it's been a long time. And we have a very big um, body of research showing that <laughs> it pays to talk. It's important to talk. And code reviews is one of the ways uh, where we get to talk, where we get to share our work. And uh, also, there are a few things that you cannot really test for. So code review is your only option to uh, improve. Sometimes you can do some improvements by yourself by going back to the code that you wrote yesterday or last week. And uh, sometimes you have to bring another set of eyes, another person. So uh, performance, security, uh, readability, uh, multi-threading is best debugged by looking at the code. <laughs> okay. The problem with code reviews is that they necessarily involve judgment. Anyone ever felt judged in a code review? Okay. Please speak up. There is not going to be a Q&A slide. Questions are now. Comments are now. I see a lot of people who have probably written more than a few lines of code in their careers. So you probably have had some experience with code review. Please speak up. So. Yeah, code reviews are about judgment. We are going there to be judged. We are bringing code there to be judged. It's very different. Sometimes there isn't, but ideally you do want to, to have it differently. We are not judging the coder. We are trying not to judge the person who offered the code or the pair who wrote the code. Uh, still, we are going to make comments. What's good, what's bad. We are going to express our opinions. That's the whole point. Sometimes we will be expressing hard facts, like this is terrible. It's not a fact. <laughs> it's an opinion. 
or this is not going to work, well, hopefully there is a test that shows that it does work. Let's talk about it. So um, big problem with code reviews, as they often happen, is they are judging people. Uh, there is a winner and a loser. Did you pass a code review? It is a common phrase that gets asked in many teams. You don't pass a code review. You do a code review and you improve afterwards, regardless of where you were or what happened there. Uh, there is no lose. There shouldn't be any losers. If you are putting uh, someone on the defensive, be it a reviewer or the author who brought in the code, this is a fa failed process. That particular code review is doing more harm than good. Uh, Another part oh, that I find often not addressed is they're getting attention to the code they write. I don't know about you, but I've met a lot of people who say, oh, it's my code, don't look at it. I f I, it it's not perfect, I feel bad about it, please don't look at it. This is a strange idea. Code is our work, but it's not direct value to the client or to the user, right? What the, the valuable thing is what the code does. But still, we are proud of our code, or not, uh, and getting attention to that intermediate work product is a good thing. If someone is genuinely interested in how you think about the problem, it's a compliment. They want to know your opinion. They want you as part of the team. They trust that you have developed valid insights into how your business problem is being solved as in building software. So this is something that should be brought up in code reviews more often. Bad code doesn't get reviewed. Ideally, it doesn't get written. Uh, looking at the code means we have high hopes for it. We expect it to work. We expect it to bring value. And finally, does anyone have a code review situation where the manager, the tech lead, the top architect, one person reviews everybody's code? Yeah, it's, it's, it's not that rare. <laughs> it's, it's not as often that people who come to conferences admit to having it. But um, everyone should be a reviewer because you all have valid insights and the architect might have been on the job the longest. That means they have the most baggage. In addition to have a lot of valid insights. But the person who joined yesterday they also have some questions to ask and some ideas to offer, otherwise they wouldn't be there. Everyone should be looking at everyone else's code, probably not every line, but as much as possible to get the most value from the exercise. Okay, I hope you like VN diagrams, because I do. <laughs> and this is spheres of knowledge. When the author writes the code, well, they know the most about a piece of code, a class, a function, a method, what have you. Uh, we don't know everything. The, the sliver that's outside of sphere of knowledge of the offer is uh, bugs, the things that we don't expect our code to do that nevertheless happen. Uh, if you have anyone on your team who never writes any bugs, they probably haven't been there for a very long time. <laughs> and the, the rest of the team, here I notice that the reviewer is someone who has no experience with the code. Maybe they heard of the requirements in the, in the group meeting. Maybe they haven't. They're completely brand new. They know nothing. At this point, offer shouldn't go on vacation. Should something happen? Should the bug pop up? Uh, they ever wants to deal with the code. After the code has been reviewed, the picture becomes uh, much more together, right? The reviewer has gotten quite a bit of information about the code, not complete. The author learned a little bit more as well, and the bug portion has gotten smaller. So we probably haven't cut everything, but we did cut a significant portion. More importantly, we have at least a few people knowing what's going on in there and not afraid to touch it. Okay. Joint code ownership. Is this a thing? Does everybody do that? Or are you in your own little silo, like 
with developers working for the company, <laughs> for, for the small company uh, owner who I talked to a few years ago, <laughs> writing your own code in your own cubicle by yourself. Anyone else say no, say something. Uh, I think it's a big deal because people leave, people want to take vacation uh, because products, uh, successful products, hopefully products we are working on right now are going to be successful. Successful products have long lifespans, sometimes really long lifespans, way beyond our expectation how long we want to work there. A lot of people want to move on after six to 12 months, not necessarily change jobs, but at least change projects. It's great for the team, and the team being not this particular set of people, but the team that will continue to surround this project. Uh, and it's extra work. It doesn't come for free. You have to put work in, in develop for longevity. Uh, at the same time, you get better skills and product quality right now. This is not for the future. Even if your product works in the next three weeks and then it's no longer needed, if for example, you are doing a sales campaign for something that's not going to be a thing after this month, uh, you still get better product quality. You get fewer bugs, you get better performance, you get better whatever it is you care about in your product. Okay, I don't know if you read I am developer, on it's, it's a Twitter. Size matters. Anyone ha has code reviews that are 20 pages at a time? Everything is either fine or terrible, right? There, there, is no, there is no way to maintain focus and to actually look at every line. You have to limit how much you try to process at the same time. I've been in code review meetings that are scheduled for days in a row. Sometimes it's 40 hours, it's a full week, you, you spend in a room looking at somebody else's code. It becomes unproductive after about 60 minutes. It becomes less productive after about 30 minutes. After 60 minutes, everybody is checked out, except maybe the person who is yelling how bad everything is and the author who is suffering. <laughs> so, uh, be agile. Don't wait until you've got 20 pages of code to review. Start small. Start with half a page or less. Um, the earliest, um, the earliest uh, code review process has been re described by Fagan. This is a very old flowchart. If it looks waterfallish, it's because it is. It's from that er era. Uh, and the code was supposed to be printed makes sense. It's easier to read if it's on paper than it is on screen and than it was back then for the code that was on screen. And the author gets to explain and defend the code while everybody else gets to attack it. And the whole thing is a meeting. Uh, granted how people worked on their individual projects for six weeks or more back then, that's how you get to 20 pages of code or more. It, and it's seriously painful. Uh, I don't know if you've had experience with this, but I hope you didn't. And if you did, I'm sorry. And let's make this not happen to anyone going forward. <laughs> uh, there is no winners in this one. Yes, you're going to catch a few bugs. You're not going to catch as much as you could for the amount of effort you're putting in. And you're going to destroy whatever trust and good relationships you had on the team if you do this. Uh, there are Lots of examples, uh, historical and not so old, unfortunately. Uh, I've been in code reviews where people cried. It, it, it was bad, bad. <laughs> if somebody has to explain the code or defend the code, you're also not getting to think through their logic for yourself. So you're learning how, how that code operates is not as good as it could have been if you did the reading yourself. So let's talk about how to do it better. Okay, what we want to inspect in code review is 
how the code looks, how the code reads, and architecture, the abstraction behind it, what the person was thinking. This, this is a big bucket list. A bunch of stuff is going to be specific and small uh, comments. You look like you have something to say. Okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> and then there is test coverage. And by the way, when you get the code review, there should be test coverage already. Test coverage, that's unit tests, that's stuff that's written by the developer, and it should be helpful to reviewers in reading the code. So those are the questions that we want to ask. Readability is a big deal. In code review, we are asking other people to read our work. We shouldn't make it hard on them. By extension, we shouldn't make it hard on the maintenance programmer who is going to come a year down the road when we are no longer there, or maybe when we are there but doing something else and doesn't break anything or, in fact, everything. Because you, you can't touch something that should fix a bug and then introduce 50 new ones. Uh, what we shouldn't be doing in code review Explaining, running automated tools. Automated tools should be part of your process. Don't waste valuable people time on automated tools. Uh, reasons why this code is bad. There is no reason for the code to be bad. I if it's terrible, if you need to run it once and forget about it, run it and let's talk about the results. If it's going to be run again by somebody other than you, make it less terrible. <laughs> and then there are arguments about preferences. I've sat through a number of discussions about var. Uh, there are curly brackets that's been there forever. Uh, do you put semicolons in JavaScript or not? Like, if you want to argue about this, great. Just don't do it in code review. Code review is hard enough activity, and we are spending enough effort on it not to put in things that are not resolvable in principle, as history shows. Uh, fun, anyway, and take up a lot of time. Just not, don't bring them here. <laughs> code review doesn't substitute for QA. You're not going to find everything. You still need both developer testing and UAT testing. You should have already fixed all the compiler warning by the time you get to code reviews. And code review is not where you set uh, your standards. You already should have sta standards before you get to code review because that's how you wrote the code. Code review can bring up relevant questions about your standards, formatting tools, patterns, what you bring into your code, what you don't bring into your code. Uh, but you don't make these decisions in code review discussion. It's part of a separate conversation uh, you need to have probably an entire team where a code review is not necessarily an entire team, uh, but more people is better. Okay, so there is the question. All code must be perfect. What do you think? Is all code, you're right, perfect? No. Well, the answer is it depends. How, how, how stable it is, how, in which ways is it bad? If the code runs slowly, is it a problem? Well, it depends. Sometimes not very much if you've got an internet delay and you're arguing about string buffer versus string builder. Like, who cares? <laughs> uh, should you consider bringing non-perfect code to code review? Yes, absolutely. We're in the business of building products, not in the business of writing perfect code. So it's okay for the code to, to not be perfect. It has to be good enough for, for what the team is building. What we are looking for in code review, specifically in code review as an activity, we want to fix whatever is wrong with the code right now. We want to put in uh, the work so that the code becomes better over time. That's very mentoring and uh, knowledge sharing and uh, 
enforcing common practices and formats comes in. And finally, it's building a technical community. Hopefully, you build trust and respect for your teammates in a code review meeting, not destroy the social capital. Become, you actually form the mentor, rela mentor mentee relationships. You, you actually learn who is good at what and how to argue together so that you can solve harder problems. Well, there is no harder problems than how code should look like. So that you can solve other conflicts better. That's a big exercise in working as a team. Okay, part of the thing that uh, tends to be overlooked in code reviews is code that is good. People don't give enough compliments. Have you given a compliment in code review recently? Please do next week when you get to the office. I tried to give at least a couple during the 15, 20 minutes conversation that we have for code reviews, especially to younger developers, especially to people who showed up and I still, who just showed up to the industry and are still nervous to having their work ex inspected by uh, more senior folks. We are definitely looking for bugs. Uh, but that's a, that's a given. They are always looking for bugs and they are much easier to find and fix while they are in code review. They're looking for bad code. Bad code that leads to bugs in the future, even though not necessarily now. All sorts of gotchas in the code. Where it, it, you think it's a, it does this, but it does something else. So if you rely on the first result happening, something else will happen. They're looking for erratic code. Code should be consistent. If somebody went into another person's code and put their style mark all over the place, that often makes uh, the code less consistent and har harder to read. Teams should have their own consistent style. Code reviews is a wonderful way to make sure everybody is on the same page as for what code should look like. And illities, things that you cannot really test uh, or really hard to test and you don't have resources. So, uh, dependencies, scalability, security, how much throughput you're going to get and, and where are your bottlenecks. This is, it's possible to figure out by testing, but it's so much easier to start looking in the right direction, uh, even before you plug in a profiler, in code review. This is all you're going to see upon inspection, you just need to be looking at the right piece. What we're building is common vision, so that the team is on the same page and in sync and how they think both about the project that they're building, the requirements that are coming in, and how the code should look like, what, what abstractions it should build. Okay, I, can't, I don't like meetings. I don't know if you do, but uh, a lot of people find themselves more productive not in a meeting setting. Uh, for a long time, I worked with a very strong technical team that uh, did a ton of code reviews, almost none of them in a meeting. Uh, the code review worked like this. People sent out a code review request. This code is pushed to this branch. Those are the files or the diffs or whatever. Uh, this is how you access them. Uh, let me know. P please review it. Whoever had the time, whoever was able to take a break, would send a response to the entire group. Here are my comments. Sometimes a current conversation was warranted, sometimes it was just something silly. Misspellings or, you know, you forgot this requirement that's fallen through instead of, go, uh, instead of taking care of this additional variable. This was happening like four times a day. It took 15 minutes a pop and, uh, Everybody was everybody's reviewer and everybody got to read comments of everybody else on all pieces of code. So not all of us did the, the every line of code that other people wrote, but every line of code got reviewed by at least two to three people. And yes, we had conversations because sometimes it would be, I'm not sure what we're supposed to do. I'm not sure what we're supposed to mean. And that's very fake conversation. 
There was also a lot of exploratory advice. Have you considered looking at it from this angle and writing your code accordingly? And sometimes it's a good suggestion and sometimes it's a suggestion that leads nowhere, but somebody has to put the work in to find out which one. If a question doesn't get asked, this never happens. And then there was follow-up because the offer waited a couple of hours until they were ready to switch from whatever they were doing next and did the follow-up. They looked at the comments that came, uh, incorporated some, asked follow-up questions, and uh, the code went out. Uh, so here's how I recommend we prepare and how we did preparation when everything went well, is we did write unit tests carefully. One of the things that I see continuously happening with uh, test coverage is some things get forgotten and some things get tested multiple times. Uh, having multiple uh, tests for the same thing is a problem because if, if that thing changes, you have a lot of breakage in tests. You don't want that. You want to be able to ch change tests, uh, uh, to change code easily, and that includes keeping tests running. We had code quality tools that were run as part of the process before anything got promoted anywhere. And of course, we fixed problems found by both uh, tests and uh, code quality tools. Part of the work that reviewer has to do ahead of time is familiarize themselves with the code they are reviewing. If we don't know what code is supposed to be doing, we can't really judge the architecture, the abstraction that the code is trying to match. As a reviewer, you have to read the code and you have to look at the tests, and it's quite a bit to read. Tests are helpful in understanding the code, but they are less reading. They should be less dense reading. Uh, code should be easy to read, and it's a big deal. What makes a code readable? It depends on your team. It depends on everyone on your team. Uh, what you all know, what you all do together, uh, what tools you use. Here is an example. If you write code in something like VI, then having more files is a pain. If you use a normal modern IDE, you have search across files, please have more files. <laughs> It's a problem that got solved in technology. It's easy. Um, there was a great talk uh, by uh, Kevin Henney in London, he, he, where he addressed having um, including a bunch of things, having a bunch of dependency includes. People say that they clutter the, the code, and they do. They take sometimes a full page. Uh, is this a problem? I don't think it's a problem, and it hasn't been for a long time if you're using a modern IDE. Your includes get collapsed. You only look at them if you want to. Most of the time you spend looking at the code, you're actually seeing the code. You're not looking include at include lines. Have as many as you need. It's not an issue. If you need to manage your dependencies, sure, but don't worry about import statements. OK, what makes code readable? Short code blocks. If you have even 25 lines, single space, all in a single block, it, it's probably hard to keep track of. Don't do that. Right. Extract a method. Minimize nestedness. Nestedness is a problem. Even as in the picture shown on the right, uh, right, right. Uh, it's uh, too much. Don't have if else. Have an if and everything else falls through. And the important part is what you see is what you get. Anyone not familiar with the acronym? Uh, web developer. Uh, this is an old acronym. Code should be straightforward. What it tells you happens, happens. Not something else and not the opposite. Uh, this is often a problem. Don't be afraid to delete comments. Sometimes comments will state just the opposite of how the code works or sometimes something irrelevant. And that can throw people off and cause bugs. This is a code donut. <laughs> I, I don't know if you've seen this project, but uh, it was written as toy code. Uh, it runs. It shows an ASCII donut moving in space. 
it is kind of fun, but it's to it's a toy. Don't do it at work. Uh, <laughs> what takes away from readability? If you don't have any white space, having too much white space makes you scroll. Having not enough white space makes you lost in text. So there is a judgment call there. Again, you'll decide it with your team. How much is enough? If, else, if, else, and so, so forth is painful. It's really hard to keep track. Computers are distant at that. Humans are not. Humans have to look at the code to maintain it. Double negatives are terrible. <laughs> and then side effects. If, you have, if some work is happening here and the rest over there, the over there is going to get forgotten, then here change it. Uh, that's a certain setup for bugs. If not this, then next time. Logic. Your code should be explicit about what it's doing. Assumptions should be visible. This is really hard. When you work on something for a while, the assumptions become ingrained. You know them. You memorize them by heart. Once you walk away from the code or somebody else who hasn't been in that particular tunnel with you, in that particular rabbit hole, they don't have those assumptions. They have to start from scratch. Um, make assumptions visible as much as you can. Do it early. It's best if you learn it. And keep them in the code. Do not delete them. It could be in the forms of asserts. It could be in the form of tests. It's better if they are executable, not in comments. Do not repeat yourself. If you repeat yourself, you, you wrote more code than you had to, and you made people read more than they had to. More is worse. Having less code is better. <laughs> if you can delete code based on a code review, that's a win. <laughs> and then test every scenario once. OK, naming. I hope you find this interesting. <laughs> Terminology. Some terminology is accepted and it's per domain. And in that case, anything goes. If it's an accepted acronym, use it. If it's an acronym you just ma made up, don't. <laughs> uh, abbreviations. Uh, names should be short, but not any shorter than possible. I see people doing one letter names, one, two letter names, and sometimes I see names that are like a full sentence and run off the screen. Both are pretty bad. You'll find your middle. You'll find what's acceptable. It should read in reasonable English. Uh, and names should be easy to distinguish. But that's a fun one. Uh, result, response, and return, sometimes abbreviated to red, are not helpful. They are all the same. You can have a, at least one, at most one of those, and better not to have any, have an actual name. Integer, if you're going to have value that's already pretty bad, don't create values in the same scope or ideally in the same project. There is no reason to save on vowels. There is no reason to save on letters. Letters are free in code. Write more. <laughs> uh, if you're going to have personal details, you are not allowed to have personal details. Uh, single space tends to be better and more reasonable. Uh, to read. So personal detail is probably better than personal details. Person's details is horrible. It's two multiple uh, nouns together. You'll, you'll come up with stuff that your team continuously uses and you'll decide which ones are good and bad. And the way you know which ones are good and bad is where you get more questions. If people are asking what that means, it's probably not clear. And it doesn't need a comment. It needs a change. OK, code quality. It's the kitchen sink. It's whatever you consider code quality. Uh, all the patterns that you like, if you are doing memory management, then is everything closed? If you are doing uh, stateful objects, is the state initialized properly? Are exceptions handled? Code should reflect understanding understanding of uh, where you are in the project and what your system looks like. And code review is one of the better places to make sure everyone is on the same team. If somebody asks, what is this? 
what's a great point to stop and discuss what it is you're building. Because we're probably going to be pieces of code that we're working on that contradict the vision that you put into your, s I into your piece. That's where bugs happen. That's where hard bugs happen. Bugs that are not that easy to find and sometimes hard to fix. Make sure you talk about the overall shape and where this new piece fits in. So technical details, you, you should already have standard practices by the time you got to code review. Do not decide them in code review. You can, uh, code base should have a feel of its own, and that's how you get there, but don't decide what that feel should be in code review. You should know requirements, you should have institutional knowledge, but the main uh, repository of institutional knowledge is the code itself. It runs. As long as it runs, it's the ultimate truth. A lot of projects don't get requirements. You just get to rewrite the prior system that used to work, except it needs to do something else and it can't, or it's too slow to change. So your requirements are often in the code, but you need to talk about them to understand what they actually are. OK, this is sometimes a point of contention. Should we discuss tests and code reviews? Should tests be well, well written? Is it important? Opinions? Yes? Anyone says no? You, uh, sometimes people say no. Uh, there is a reason. We don't ship tests to the customers. Customers don't care if tests pass, pass or fail, or at least they say they don't care, right? So why should we be looking at tests? Well, first, we should be looking at tests because tests are helpful. We will be looking at tests if there is a crisis and something is broken in production, and the test is the first place where we go to. We should have experience with this portion of the code. Um, Tests should be running at all times, so if you're building something new and suddenly breaking half the tests, it's a problem. Suddenly building something new has gotten twice as expensive in your time. So yes, everyone should be familiar with all the tests in the system, not just the tests that they wrote for their own work. Uh, requirements to the test readability and naming might be a little bit relaxed, but they're still there. Tests still should should still be readable. There should be a reasonable amount of white space. There should be visible logic. Outcomes. Yeah, don't don't be part of this code review. <laughs> The outcome is not figuring out what is stupid. <laughs> the outcome is to learn something and to produce recommendations and ideas which we wouldn't otherwise have. And part of recommendations come as try it out, right? So maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, but suddenly you have multiple smart heads thinking about this instead of one. Uh, there is an Additional conversation, if you are writing code as a pair, do you need code review at all? Right? After all, we write list two people writing the code. Uh, I think you do need code reviews, but at the same time, it's your ROI is going to be a little less, especially if your pairs are not stable, especially if you are not coding with this other person the entire time. You are on that team. Uh, as you're writing the code, you get into the rabbit hole, you get into a tunnel, thinking about just that, and getting in from the outside can be hard, even if there are two people in there. <laughs> if you switch pairs often, the problem becomes less. Uh, if, you s if the piece of code you're writing is small enough, the problem becomes less. I but if your work is sufficiently complicated that you need to be parent to begin with, you probably want other people on it too. More programming is good, <laughs> even though it's sometimes more expensive than we want to put in effort for. Okay, follow-up. There is definitely work in the follow-up to code review. 
you have to get back the recommendations for the code review to be helpful. Uh, it's not enough to just write them and read them, although al that already is part of the benefit. Uh, offer often makes changes based on what they heard, and sometimes it would be recommendations, and sometimes it would be questions. If you're afraid to make recommendations to that chief architect who typically reviewed everybody else's code, but their code was sequestered separately and nobody got to look at it, at least you'll ask them, do you mean this to be that? Can you is it possible to have better naming than A221? <laughs> Um, so apply learning. You probably learned something both as an author and as a reviewer by looking at other people's uh, work. And there's going to be the next code review because in the two, three hours that you waited for something, you probably wrote something else, <laughs> right? So code reviews should be small, they should be frequent, and they should be in a tight loop pretty much everything we do in Agile software development. Fast feedback type. Things that, hap that I see happening a lot if you have small code reviews is people challenge the advice. Uh, people who come in sometimes scared when we start a new pattern. Uh, they already prepared to defend their code, so they'll push back. Why should I change the name? Well, we can talk about having good names. Uh, do more research. A lot of the time recommendation will be do this, it will be better. Sometimes this doesn't work. And the person who suggested it had the reason for suggesting it and it might have worked if it could, but it doesn't for whatever reason that wasn't obvious. What do you do then? You don't do exactly as they suggested, but you try to make it more obvious why this is the best way, or why this is the best way out of suggested ways. And a lot of the time we ask for clar clarification. So sometimes people will say, you should write it this way, but the question becomes why? What's the reason for the change? Change has a cost, if it's good enough, but there are different options, sometimes those options are better, sometimes they are not better, they are the same. There are multiple ways to do things. Okay, I think this is in a nutshell. Technical quality is what we are trying to achieve with code reviews. And technical quality is not free, it takes time. It takes a community, it takes a team working together. And it doesn't happen at once. You can't sit down for two months and review all your code base and maybe fix it, uh, but, but it does take iterations. As, as you're moving forward, uh, you have to get back to pieces uh, that you have reviewed before, but they're maybe too bad or too big to tackle all at once. Um, I was sp uh, speaking to a coach at a big organization uh, that had very uneven teams and he was saying that he limits his recommendations to three or four per person. If, an, if someone brings their code, they get three or four recommendations from the top guy because those are the recommendations we are going to take seriously. Because more than three or four, we are going to be overwhelmed we are going to be and we are going to be defensive. Also, he tried to encourage them to do multiple code reviews on changes and some Sometimes there were changes on the code we already written because there are bugs and something needs to be changed. So he'll offer different advice on each iteration, trying to see what will stick. It, it was a major mentoring event and it worked amazingly well. Over a couple of years, uh, the worst people left and the next player became better. So it, it was really, uh, it was working amazingly. And everyone was happy. There was no cries in those code reviews. <laughs> okay, so back to the picture. We are trying to make the code better. We are trying to write good code. We are trying to complement good code because positive reinforcement builds a team and leads to better, uh, to better code bases, to better work, to better working software. 
We are trying to build sh shared understanding. The team has to be on the same page what we are building in order for the thing to work. Most of hard bugs are in integration. So we have to be we have to know what the other person is thinking. And code reviews are about improving over time. You can solve problems right away. Your tests might be able to, to find the problem right away. Code reviews are a slow best. I think that's it. I don't know how I'm doing on time. Questions? You've been very quiet. By the way, I appreciate people who did speak up. <laughs> Thank you. Questions, comments? Yes, please. Code reviews are more beneficial if you don't do testing. Hi however, not doing, they are more beneficial. If, if they are the only thing you are doing, they are going to be so much more beneficial. You are still doing the scary thing. I hope you don't care about the outcome of your application. <laughs> yes. Sorry. Uh, 15 to 25 percent of, uh, the question is what percentage of time per week is spent on code review? Uh, we are looking at 15 to 25 percent and that's for a team that spends a lot of time writing code, uh, fairly complicated code and I think it's it's the same week in and week out. It doesn't change over time. So 15 to 25 is the answer. You had a question. Okay, that's a great question. I, I don't know if everybody heard. Uh, the question was, how do you make sure people accept comments and don't see it as criticism and don't get upset? How to make sure people understand that you're commenting on a code and not on them personally and you're not passing a very terrible judgment on them instead of making a comment on their code? Uh, I think the big general banner kind of answer to this is be nice. And, <laughs> and, and it's not in code review or just in code review. It's in your work, in your team communication. You have to give compliments as well. It makes a difference if this person is the only one being on the receiving end of a criticism or if other people are open to criticism as well. And if everything else fails, invite them to have a beer after work and talk to them. I, I'm really trying to talk to you about code and there are things that I don't understand. So I don't really mean to say that something is wrong. I just want to know better. So that's my suggestion. I'll be happy to talk to you after. Questions? I think I'm out of time. Thank you so much, Jane. That